Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural speaker series for the new uh, Georgetown University Urban and Regional Planning Program. I'm Nicole Wittenstein, the director of the uh, planning program. So thank you all for being here today. Um, as many of you all know, we've se seen a lot of familiar faces here. We've been working our way through a lineup of really great all-star people in the field of planning in this speaker series. Um, we've heard from regional planners, we've heard from city planners, federal planners. So today we're very excited to have a neighborhood planner. Um, and not just from any neighborhood. Um, we're honored to host Richard Bradley, president of the downtown DC Business Improvement District. Mr. Bradley has made extraordinary contributions to the vitality of the city of Washington, DC as well as being a leading global thinker on how urban districts can be organized to fully leverage the support of the private sector. We are delighted he's able to join us here today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me make some qualifications, uh, however, to that. Um, my wife's the planner. Uh, that's enough planners for in, in any family. One, one is absolutely enough. Uh, I'm actually an English major. Uh, and when I graduated from, from college, I was a junior high school teacher. And quite frankly, being the junior high school teacher has been what's most important to me in my work because I feel a good deal of my time is spent going out on that playground to make sure people play fair and work together. But in many respects, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk in terms of a story. Uh, as I said, I'm an English major. Um, stories are what interest me. And uh, quite frankly, you're sitting here part of a fascinating continuing story and it's the story about the transformation of the city. It's a story about the transformation of this downtown. Uh, and as we all know, the centers play an inordinately important role in any city. Or centers play an important role in anything. The, the center has to hold, as poets tell us, as psychologists tell us. So in many respects, the efforts that we had undergoing in the district going back 20 years ago was first focused on rebuilding the center. Um, if many of you recall, some of you were probably if you're anything recalling, then you're recalling what we were doing in kindergarten. But uh, 20 years ago, um, the city was bankrupt. Um, there wasn't much in the way of services anywhere. Um, and certainly in downtown, uh, if we had police services, they were essentially responding to a call for need. And the only trash pickups happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. And other than Metro running here, that was the nature of public service. And if you came downtown, uh, as I I've probably said too often to too many people, if we had a brand in 1990, 95, it was dull, dirty, and dangerous. Um, now, I haven't stolen that particular brand. Uh, Times Square uses it, too. Uh, they add a little more danger to it. it. We weren't quite as dangerous as that experience, but we were certainly that. And the business leadership came together, uh, essentially taking advantage of legislation that had finally been passed. It took a decade for the Business Improvement District legislation to pass, um, in which <laughs> strange legislation that the council wouldn't let the business district move forward. It's, it's legislation that allows the business district to tax themselves over and above what they pay in their, in their normal taxes to be channeled into an area for improvements. Many of you may know that, and, and that's how that works. Well, we were the first bid. And when we got started, we had a budget of about $6 million. And um, we focused initially on making downtown clean, safe, and friendly. And that was the start. I, I remember meeting with many of the business leaders, and I was trying to get them to develop a vision. Back in the, in the, uh, in the 90s, visioning was a big deal. I don't know in planning field if visioning is still important. Uh, we sort of moved to strategy these days, action agendas. But vision somehow gets tied in there with mission and stuff like that. So I said, so what's your vision? Um, and they kind of looked at me, and they said, clean and safe. And I said, could we add friendly? Yeah, all right, you're kind of pushing it here. And I said, well, how about a vision of downtown Washington as maybe being the premier destination for office and commercial and cultural offerings? Notice I didn't include residential or retail. And they went, in the region, OK, we, we, we could buy that. And then I ventured a little further, and I said, well, what, what do you think about maybe thinking of ourselves at some time being world class or global? And I looked out, and I realized my job was in jeopardy. I mean, there was no ability to think beyond those parameters. Could we get the city clean and safe, and could we become a good, strong office economy again? That was kind of it in 95. That, that, was, that was what we were looking for. And that was the level of it. We'll come back around at the end here and talk about the fact of where we now stand in terms of the global economy, because we are 
now recipients of vast amounts of investment that now come from overseas. So, so in 20 years' time, we've gone from clean and safe to being a place that now is receiving global capital. So, but the story I want to tell today isn't so much about that past, but it's really more about the future. And I want to take you there through this, this slide presentation. So let me kind of go back uh, a little bit here. Uh, and this was sort of in, in January of 1994. Um, what, what you see here are a whole bunch of red blots. They were mostly parking lots. Um, those were, the developers like to call parking lots development sites. Uh, we had a lot of development sites at that point in time. And that was the boundary of our area. This is where we folks, this is the old downtown. As you know, the, in, in, the, in the 60s, the right quarter was down 14th Street. The development moved over to Connecticut K. This area was kind of left you know, to sort of languish. But the development community kind of knew and recognized it will change. And the one thing that was going to happen to us of great consequence was right over there next to the portrait gallery was the development of the uh, Verizon Center, then known as the MCI Center. Abe Poland had made the decision to bring the sports team back downtown. And so that was moving forward. So that was the bright light that was, that was turned on and otherwise kind of dull place. So today, if we look at it, that's all that's left. And if you would like to own one of those parking lots and not use it, you're wasting an awful lot of money um, because the land values today are, are inordinately high. Um, people are now selling real estate. Uh, people were selling real estate back then at about $200 a square foot. Now it's $600 a square foot. So it's been a dramatic change. So this is what, what we look like today. But we look back as well and just to, to see what would happen. We arrive at this point. I'm sorry, let, let keep going forward. We arrive at the point of essentially now that People think we're built out and the game is over. Um, but it does not mean we're complete. In the next five to 10 years, we will witness a downtown transformation as dramatic as in the past decade. And I want to suggest that this, is, this isn't just about more, it's about different. And again, you're sitting in the difference. This was Atlantic Studios. This was to have been a studio. This is now a place of learning. If we look around, you're going to see more of that. So this is, this is part of that transformation that's now, now taking place. Uh, so here, here's the picture of what happened in terms of employment. Just to, again, I'm looking a little bit to the past because it'll give you a sense of when I talk about what's coming in the future. That's the kind of trajectory. We added um, you know, close to 60,000 jobs. Actually, up to five years ago, we were accounting for almost 90% of the jobs being created in the city. And the important thing to say here is that the jobs we create here are not just high value jobs. They're about 25% of the jobs are those that would be accessible to anybody with minimal, minimal skills, working in restaurants, uh, service workers in, in buildings, working in retail. So we really have created huge numbers of opportunity. But no matter what, this has been the economic engine of, of, of not only the downtown, but the city. In terms of the population, um, <laughs> there weren't many people living here in 1990. Uh, I think I recall correctly, what's the number? It says um, about 1,000, yeah. There weren't, there weren't many. Um, and they were mostly living in Chinatown and subsidized housing. That, that was kind of an, And the goal back then, from a planning point of view, was to create a livable downtown. They were talking about a livable downtown. Because the whole notion of just trying to make, and that was a planner's like hope. And as I said, by even 95, even the developers didn't have a hope for being livable. They just said, make, bring the office market back. Give us, give us some workers here. But you can see the kind of trajectory. But what's really relevant here is what's happening around us uh, and within, within a mile of the downtown, that's the, that's the transforming number. And I think that's going to continue to grow in a very dramatic way. So here's what's happened in terms of the scale of investments and the different kinds of investments. Almost $10 billion in private sector buildings. You have the federal buildings. You have DC buildings. Then you have this whole notion of economic development subsidies and incentives of $505 million. The interesting thing about those development incentives, not one of them was DC taxpayer dollars. This is, these are things like tax increment financing. This is land. There, there is no money. The, we, we've all understood the game has to be played here in such a way that most of the investments, economic development investments, are going to go to the neighborhoods. But there are things the city can do and has done for us of immense consequence. So it really hasn't been all that much. But if one were looking at a leverage ratio there, it's, it's like 1 to, to, to 20. And in terms of the bid, the private sector has contributed $135 million over that period of time. So there's been some substantial efforts here to, to bring about that change. And those are, those are the, the numbers. Now, here's the other thing. But, and this, is in some respect, is, this, is the important story. Uh, it wasn't just that we put up more office. But if you look at these other things, it's hotel, 
convention center, residential, cultural and tenant shopping. The last decade has been as much focused on that and making that happen. We did, we did take advantage of tax abatement. That, that's a, that's a, an incentive the city had. But the trade there, which was the city was willing to forego the investment, the, the taxes on, on commercial property, the, the rentals that would come in from residential, in return for the income from residents. And anybody knows about living in the District of Columbia, you pay income tax here. So the, the city got back $5 for every one it gave up. It was a pretty good deal. And that's how we were able to get residential started here. The same thing came true for culture and entertainment and, and the, certainly the efforts in terms of the convention center. That was a matter of a land swap. That's how that, how that came to be. And a TIF that, that's making that work. So let me, let me go on. So here, here's where we arrive today. Um, people like Richard Florida are, are talking about us and in fact, well, recently in an Atlantic piece, he, he put Washington in the category with New York and Houston as the cities over, of the last 10 years that are now positioned to kind of move forward. Um, Aaron Wren, I think, is kind of interesting, kind of looking at us in the future, that we may become the second city on track to displace Chicago and Los Angeles. What he talks about that isn't necessarily population. Our population is actually, when you think about Washington, and I think he's thinking if you, if you laid Los Angeles on top of Washington or Chicago, it would include Fairfax and Montgomery. For all intents and purposes, I think that's the wise way to think of us. That's what Washington is. So when you look into our present uh, uh, sort of population of this area, 50% of us have, are college educated and 25% have advanced degrees. That's, that's, the, that's the value that's here. And you combine that and, and the, the movement of the future, and you begin to think, and we'll talk some more about this in a minute, as uh, the, the, the key infrastructure investment of the next decade is gonna be Union Station and, and, and the Amtrak service to New York. Get that, get that time down, and we really begin to build this single East Coast, if you like, what do they call it, megapolis. But the reality is emerging today, and that's gonna be for us, that's our port. And we will take advantage of that, and that's why there's that possibility. It's nice to be considered there. Whether or not we get there, it, it's irrelevant. But the, we're also changing. So here's where, how we've been invest, how we've been ranked uh, consistently for a long period of time in terms of uh, not only national rankings of foreign investors in real estate, but global rankings. And, and, and it's that global ranking, they've been just paying attention and watching it, that Washington's economy never flies as high or drops as low, it's steady predictable income. And so projects like the city center project here or the convention center hotel, those are sovereign wealth funds behind those projects. But if you look at most other projects in Washington now, you'll usually find some kind of capital. I think the car company recently went out and I think developed a $150 million fund, uh, mostly Israeli money. Um, and, and it's of great consequence to be able to enjoy that because that money, once it comes, tends to stay. Uh, it's also cheaper. And it, it's, it looks for longer returns. It's not in and out money. So we, we've reached a plateau that's really important to us here. And that's the kind of what sets us moving forward in the future. So I'm going to shift over here for a moment. Uh, we'll go on the internet because this is the way we try to demonstrate, I think, in some way, shape, or form, the nature of what downtown is and how it's going to become. And you'll see it's a fairly dynamic place uh, that, that's emerging here. One of the things that we, we felt we needed to do was to take the downtown and realize that it's emerging into a number of different distinct places. At one point in time, if you had a place sense, people would use the word pen quarter, sort of this area around here. That, that had the rest of it. The rest of it was kind of office. But what's emerging here and what will emerge over the next decade are a series of destinations, even within this area. Uh, we call this, it shouldn't really, it's the west end. It's the west end of the bid, not the west end of downtown. It's the west side of, of, of downtown. But that's going to emerge in a, in a significant way. The center point is certainly coming up in a, in a significant way over here. And that's the area we're in right now. And that's this, this, the, the projects there, probably the most intensive development. And then we'll get to the sort of east end, which is really the, the, effort, the area over the next decade, which I think will emerge much the way this portion of downtown has emerged in the last decade or 15 years. That's the future. That's where the future will come in terms of really dramatic change. So let me kind of come back to this, to the, to the west, west side of downtown, just to give you some sense of what's going to happen in there. One of the interesting things is this restaurant corridor that's beginning to develop along uh, 15th, uh, 15th Street. Uh, Joe Stonecrab is about to come into that area. But if you go down a little bit further, you find um, you have Old Ebbets which, by the way, is the fifth largest grossing restaurant in the United States, $23 million of sales. And the reason they built um, the Hamilton 
was because they were, 300 people were standing outside in the summertime. And they said, maybe there's an opportunity to create a new place around there. When they opened it, their major concern was that they were going to take their business from themselves. And their goal was to do another $15 million of business at the Hamilton. They're doing that. So you add Joe Stone Crab, which is probably going to do $15 million. You're going to have three restaurants in there averaging about $20 million of sales. Now, for the district, just to give you a translate that, the district is a 10% equity partner in any restaurant sales. So that's $60 million, $6 million comes back into the district, plus the jobs that get created. So that's, that's happening. But you have other things that are going on in that area as well. Trump International Hotel, um, you know, which D Donald being Donald and not paying attention to anybody else in the world says, I'm going to make the city international. Well, and we're going to go global class here. Well, thank you, Donald. We're, we're already global class, and that's kind of why you're here. Um, you know, um, but, but you look at that kind of building and what it will mean, and I think it'll be great to finally get that building alive, which well, among other things, we'll, we'll talk about this well, the redoing of Pennsylvania Avenue Central. So in that area alone, a billion dollars, that would be a nice number in most, in, in any city. That's just in that section. So um, do we have no, so this, let me talk about something else that we're paying attention to, and this gets into this other dimension of what we're becoming. It's just not more, it's the change of experience. It's the change of what the expectations can be about the nature and the kinds of uses here. We're presently working on, on Franklin Park, a joint effort of the Office of Planning, uh, the Park Service, which has jurisdiction over our parks and ourselves, <coughs> to see what we can do. It's the first of our major efforts. In downtown, we have some 30 parks and reservations. The reservations is another term the Park Service has for little pieces of land. The city does not have a park here. So we have to work with the Park Service to make all this work. So it's tricky, but the opportunity here is we think with, a, with that kind of investment, the real thing it will do is lift up the property values around that that are depressed at the moment because of the park. The irony was that the city's, the parks used to be the city's parks. They were given to the Park Service at one point in time, I believe, when we were bankrupt. Now it turns out that they're bankrupt and we have all the cash, but they won't give us the parks back. So it's a strange world that we're in at the moment. So we're going to work with them on that. But that's the kind of stuff. So let me go to central downtown. So this, this, in the short run, this is, this is the big kahunas. Um, the, the big dollars are coming in. It's almost $3.5 billion of investment. The, one of the big projects, of course, is city center. There's been a lot of talk about the scale and size of that project. Aside from the fact that it meets the highest qualities of sustainability. Um, but it's a de it was a decade in making, and it was really an attempt to bring this forward. We have the, the, the Merritt Marquis, uh, the, the Convention Center Hotel, which will finally let us maximize the use of the Convention Center. Uh, we built a convention center that only had one ballroom. The interesting thing is you really, if you want to have three conventions, everything in convention wants to have a ballroom. Well, you only have one ballroom, you foreclose conventions. This facility here will now have two other ballrooms. So we're not only going to have a headquarters hotel, so we're going to maximize the use of that building, which is immensely important, plus the jobs it creates. So um, was there another one in there, Karen, that you went, oh, and this is, I think, a fascinating project that's, that's coming along. And I think it'll be iconic, and it, it'll be one that will be interesting. It'll be debated, uh, as probably libraries should be. Uh, one of the interesting parts about the debate is whether or not it, it should be, uh, it, the height can be raised. It's a building that Mies van der Rohe designed, and I'm sure that lots of people will say, you know, leave as it is. Uh, Mies was dying as the building was uh, put up. He had very little to do with it. Um, the building, quite frankly, would not meet any standards today of any in terms of functionality. But the issue is, could you be consistent with this plan, raise it up, no matter what? The library is going to be there. It will be a building of consequence. And um, well, I think get the, the change the sense of kind of what downtown is and what it's emerging to. So this is what I'm saying about the differences of what's coming. So let's move to East Downtown. Um, we don't have a lot of dots there right now. Uh, <clears throat> but there's one dot in particular um, that's uh, pretty, pretty spectacular. Uh, this is the building over 395. Um, that's the, and what's significant about the building over 395 is that that's a scar uh, in many respects, in a nice way. Some people refer to it as a trench, um, but it really cuts us apart uh, in terms of the, the, and I think it's had a huge negative impact in that whole area of the downtown. So we're going to get a development project over that. So that's, that's the big one. There, there are several other small ones, but there's a whole bunch of other projects uh, in that area that, that are sort of emerging. Many of us are beginning to work to see if we can find a way to uh, rebuild the federal city shelter. If anybody's familiar, we have a large homeless shelter just on the other side on 2nd Avenue. Uh, that land that that shelter is on uh, could support 800,000 square, square feet of development. The present facility is 200,000 feet. So you can imagine the value in there. And in fact, we're going to try to capture that value 
to build a new facility and shelter for them and, and perhaps bring other things of consequence. There's a, there's a, there's a couple other buildings emerging, but they will have a, a huge consequence. And, and in that area, uh, I will come, come back. And do, we, do we have the picture there in the east end of uh, Union Station? Did that, did it, it, Okay, great. So, so let me shift back. We'll come back to the East End in a minute. So the other thing which we're going on here now is really to rethink K Street. Uh, and there's a long time thinking about it. And what, one of the central things is to be build down the center of it a transit way on which will come the streetcar. And that's actually, a, this is a streetcar view coming up on uh, uh, Mount Vernon Square. Um, it, it pays attention to traffic lights. And then it begins to kind of just walk itself around Sorry that we can't get the definition that clearly here. But that's kind of what it'll look like. And the, the first of the streetcars, as you know, are going to start over on H Street. It's really not a good test of the streetcar system. It's, uh, it was something Adrian Fenty said, let's do. Um, it's kind of nice to start it, but it's not a system. It's a two, two miles from nowhere to nowhere. Uh, when even when it drops people off at Union Station, it's on the, on the bridge, and you have to walk almost half a mile to the station. So we're, we hope the expectations are low. But the planning is ongoing right now for a 20-mile system, uh, which would build off that, come across K Street, then go north and south. Uh, the financing of that will emerge shortly. But that will be a central part of redoing it, about $140 million to make that a Grand Boulevard. And then Pennsylvania Avenue needs to get the same kind of remaking. And there's a partnership emerging uh, with the Park Service, the city's planning, to begin to rethink it. The idea is to begin to animate. The Park Service actually wants to give Pennsylvania Avenue back to the city. That's very generous of them. The problem is there's a huge amount of infrastructure needs. So like here, take, take a broken, you know, so the city's going, wait a minute, we're not sure we want to take that back yet. So we're trying to work that out as to how that might be able to come back. But what a great, you know, plaza. If we could have the control of those sidewalks and streets, Vending, cafes, I mean, this is a boulevard, the scale that LaFont conceived of it, that it ought to operate the way boulevards in Paris operate. And we think that's the possibility over time, and maybe with a special bid in that area. So Pennsylvania's Avenue is going to emerge. And lastly, um, the thing that probably is going to be most transformative, but it's just very basic here, is um, uh, the metro investment. Many of you are probably aware, uh, when the Silver Line opens and comes into downtown, we will actually run out of core capacity. It will be impossible to get any more trains through. Uh, the trains can only come through. It takes two minutes for a train to come in, unload. As you all know, particularly if you come in on any of the lines, you often wait while trains are unloading or loading in, in front of you at, at Union Station. We can't get any more trains through. So the only way we can expand service, because if we can't expand, the downtown's dead, is to add more cars. In the short run, we have the ability to go from six-car trains to eight. There's some eight-car trains, but not the whole system. To add uh, all, the number of cars that were necessary to go to eight car trains. Additionally, to put in, have to put in more power and then mill more facilities is $6 billion. So this, is, uh, this will need to be done, and the financing of that will have to be going to emerge shortly. We have no choice. It, it, it's not only for us, it's for the region. But we'll be remaking it. In the process of remaking it, then we'll remake Gallery, Gallery Place Station, make a connection, a pedestrian connection between Gallery Place and uh, um, uh, Metro Center, uh, because the problem right now is people have to get on and off. They come on the green line, they get on the red line to go one stop to get onto the orange line. And if you have no capacity on the red line, you can't put people on it. So you literally have got to make that possible. Same thing between the Farraguts, uh, you make the connection. So there's, we're going to remake the downtown at the same time as well. Almost a billion dollars of remaking the stations over the next decade. So that's kind of a picture of what's going on. But this is the one I, I want to refer to, which is on the eastern edge of downtown, which is Union Station. The sum total of the development is about $7 billion. Probably Union Station alone would probably be $2 billion. Um, and it does depend in part on you know, certainly what's going to happen, what Amtrak does going further up um, the, the line. But anyway, same form, I think we will find ourselves rebuilding it with a, with a huge mixed-use project off the back side of it. What this does, of course, is then take the eastern end of the downtown and now make it very much a central part. And our intention in working with the city now, we're going to talk about a small area plan, to look at this entire area and see how, what it should look like, how it should function. So for the, next, for the next four or five years, we plan it. And over the next decade, you begin to see the planning take place there. And I think we'll look to try to create the same sort of mixed use environment we've had in the downtown. So uh, if you look into 2020, uh, here's, what, here's what you'll see. In terms of a com comparison, uh, we're going to actually have almost a 40% what would, compared to what we had before, a 40% increase in the amount of investment, 6.5 as opposed to the 11 billion. In terms of jobs, 
67,000 jobs, then 27,000 more jobs coming. And for, if at the present time we get $465 million of tax revenue, we're going to add 177 million of it. In part, the addition of that additional revenue is really, in some respects, what helps the city pay for the infrastructure investment. We think the 177 is a low number. That's just the new projects. What it doesn't take into consideration is, I just come back from the UK, they refer to it as the uplift of values, the real estate values that will come along and the city will harvest the fiscal benefits. So we actually are creating a value capture approach for the infrastructure needs we're gonna have, not only for the streetcar and, and, and uh, uh, the redoing of K Street, but to make our portion of the investment into uh, the, the metro. So, so this investment in infrastructure actually then has the, um, uh, the virtuous cycle effect of then helping to raise the value of these places because it's even a more attractive place to be in. But that's, the, that's from a city's point of view, that's the impact of this. But there's one other dimension that I think is, is really important to us, and that again is this nature, the changing nature of who and what we are. Um, the, the key thing here, if you look back, is that what we did over the last decade has become a mixed-use environment. We are the, probably the, the most diverse environment of, a, of an urban place, of any such place. And when we talk about the Washington average being distributed in terms of having 13 little you know, nuclear centers around Tyson's and what have you, I mean, Tyson's now wants to call itself the new downtown. You know, I'm glad they're thinking that way, and, and, you know, but it's gonna be 25 years, and I, think, I hope they will become walkable. Uh, but, they're, but they're not walkable, and it would be a long time. We're gonna build on that, and that's really the transformation that's coming here. I, I just came from a, a fascinating meeting um, that the city had, and they're gonna start talking about it some more. Um, the deputy mayor's office announced that they're gonna have a strategy to help grow the creative industries in the city. Now, over the years, the word creative industry has been used to define cultural, uh, artistic kind of endeavors. I think we've realized that there, you know, people are entrepreneurs are creative. Uh, the, the, Universities are places of creativity. And at this point in time, the, the definition of this now is almost 20% of the economy of the District of Columbia. So they're saying, what can we do to grow that? So they had a, a professor from GW there um, sort of talking about this and all the things we would do to grow the industry. Uh, and they were, they, were, they were citing Richard Florida. And I don't know if many of you read Richard Florida's works, but, but Florida is a, uh, it, it's actually an economic geographer. And he, he not only discovered that the, you had something called the creative class that was emerging here, but he discovered what the creative class did is they liked places. They, the, the creatives like a certain place to be. And he said, if you really want to attract the creatives, you have to be in that place. You, your creatives are not going to go uh, to work for Caterpillar Tractor in Iowa. Uh, some may, you know, and I hope Caterpillar does have creative people there, but they're probably outsourcing their, their, their marketing or they're outsourcing even some of their engineering probably to places where the creatives are now. That's the shift that's taking place here. So it was fascinating to hear people talk about this at the meeting, um, and, and I, I sat in the back and so, was, someone said, do we, we don't want to add anything? And I said, yeah, there's a concern I have. We're, we're moving forward to develop these strategies, and it's all about getting these industries together, and they should talk about what they need. You've missed half of what Florida talked about. Florida talked about place. And we've actually been for the last decade building place. The district has not thought specifically about it because in, in, in none of the economic development is, agencies in the region think about it in some ways because they're, they're interested in, in Fairfax is great about jobs. The district is great about physical improvements, but no one's thought about place. But luckily, people in the development community have and they've created bids who are really about creating place. And when you're thinking about downtown Washington, we have created this place. And that's why 1776 is here now as an example, 1776, I don't know if you're familiar, it's a, uh, what do you call it, a, um, tech, it's a tech uh, incubator, incubator. Um, I think it's open about a year uh, at the moment. Um, I think, just heard the figures, I think 176 businesses that are there now, and almost 400 people employed by the various businesses that are in there. Startups, kind of come in, get space, get going, and get, get started. So th again, this is the kind of change that's taking place, but I think the Again, these are the kind of businesses want to be in mixed use areas. And I'm not suggesting we're the only place to do this. I think it's emerging on H Street. It's going to emerge in lots of other places. Uh, certainly, um, as you go up uh, into Columbia Heights, it, it's there as well on 14th Street. We're going to see the proliferation of this. But this is the strength of the district, is that we've begun to really commit ourselves to place. And that's attracting the kind of workforce that wants to be here. It's why the district's population is growing at a rate of like 1,000 a month, of which, of whom I think I've got the number correct, 60 under, 
65% uh, of the people who are doing that are under the age of 35. And, and that's between 20 and 35. There are babies being born as well. They're not kind of counted in that number. So going forward, this is what will, will distinguish us. Um, so that's kind of our story. Uh, that's the story of the, trans the continuing transformation. Um, and, and that's only part of it. I mean, I, if I went back a decade ago and thought about the story I was telling about downtown Washington, promising it would be clean and safe, we, 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 had a, 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 we stayed away from a brand. We, we did have a slogan at one time, which was, come see for yourself. Whatever your expectation was, if you thought you'd get mugged, we could probably provide that. If you thought you might be able to find you know, a steak dinner, you could probably find that at Blackie's or whatever was there. Or if you thought maybe you could see an event, you would see that. Um, but that's all we could promise then. I think what we're now promising uh, is not only a place of community for, for, the, for district and the district residents, but a, but a city that, that stands up to uh, global standards anywhere. Um, so happy to answer any questions. And, uh, Thank you for listening. I, I think they would like, there's a microphone, I guess, coming around. They'd like to capture some of this for posterity, or at least to be streamed out tonight so that I can send to my children and say, see, you know, I, I do you. something for my life. I am a resident and actually a native of Washington. I live right up the street. Um, I applaud the bid. You've done such a great job in downtown, and I love your reds coated people who helped so much. Um, are there any specific plans for the Franklin School, which is such a beautiful old building? Um, I, I, so, so, some folks back here, I think from the deputy mayor's office, or maybe you're not want to kind of comment about it, but I, but I know that it's being bid out at the moment. I think, there is a, is, am I correct on that? Does anybody want to comment on that from deputy mayor's office? Four four, there are four bids at the moment in consideration. And they run everything from, uh, boutique hotel to a cultural center, I, I, the range of, of different things. So right now, that's under consideration. One more quick yep. question. I, what, what we need more of, and certainly city center will help, is retail. Yep. And um, I noticed your chart had very little added retail, and that's um, yeah, they, I, it'd be they, wonderful if that could come to downtown again. That's well, where I, I shopped as a kid. Yeah, well, let me just say that um, that's been the, the most significant strategy um, that we've uh, been working on. But uh, what's been, f we all recognize that the issue is critical mass. So to, to a great extent, city center was the project. So the requirement of the developer is to do almost 300,000 square feet of retail, which is a destination in itself. And if that's big enough, it will, it will have then a glamour effect. What it will also have, which is, makes a difference, will be the, the nature of that retail. Um, uh, the, the kinds of stores that, that at least we're hearing, and Karen, you may have a better list than I have at the moment, uh, uh, from Armani to Pink. Space, Burberry uh, are the only ones that have been officially announced. Yeah. A lot, lot of rumors. Uh, and the largest Apple store in the region. That's all rumored. Rumored. Yeah, they, 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 Heinz will not. We, we'll all know this in the next few months. The, their whole notion is to build that. Yeah. But, but, but you're also finding, um, it, uh, someone the other day, I had lunch uh, at a restaurant, and they had just gone into TJ Maxx. And they said, what a great place to shop. And I looked at TJ Maxx, and I said, what, what do you mean, great place to shop? All, all they have are be belts there. It's just a little, they said, no, it's in the basement. Um, you know, there's a lot more retail that's kind of come into the downtown than people have realized. But I will think over the next decade, we'll begin to, to, to change that as well. And, I, and, and the city center project will make that happen. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. It, it's more like a comment. What a stimulating <coughs> discussion and presentation. And uh, what a journey for Washington, uh, this uh, magnificent city. Um, I'm a Romanian urban planner. I spent uh, the last 25 years in this country. I, I came 25 years ago, and uh, in the last 20 years, I, I work internationally, World Bank, uh, USAID, things like this. But the first time I visited Washington was in 72. And uh, you were uh, driving on steel plates. The metro was being built. Yeah, that right. And what a different picture yeah. uh, in Washington at the time, you know. And uh, uh, 20 years ago was very different, too. But I would like to, uh, to touch on your discussion uh, about the fascinating Richard Florida yeah. theory about creativity. And, and I, uh, my only concern is that that's, to me, that's pretty narrow definition of creativity because it's, it's, it's mostly focusing on, on creative, artistic endeavors where uh, uh, creativity is in everything. 
And I think, uh, you know, creativity and innovation is the essence of science and technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Washington, D.C. I, I just participated, was lucky to be in this Washington Ideas Forum um, in, with the Atlantic and Aspen Institute yesterday and today. And uh, thinking about this, probably what we need most in Washington is federal government creativity. <laughs> <laughs> that might solve a lot of problems. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Beautiful. We have to we have to we have to outsource that. Uh, Thank you. But but I want to say just to come back to your comment, I, maybe I wasn't clear enough that the definition the city has used is is beyond the the original story. But but seeing as I said these incubators as those kinds of places, because I I think you know I I, I certainly don't like to see myself not created in the creative place. I think creative problem solving. We're all creative, you know. It reminds me years ago about, you know, people thought they were athletes as opposed to, uh, isn't everybody athletic? Well, I think we're all creative, and we're particularly creative here. So I think that's the celebrate, but that's, that's the direction we're going. And I'm just saying, I think we're going to be home to people who are going to want to be here in this kind of place where they can not only bike to work, but if they want to, make a quick trip and just start biking up the C&O Canal. I mean, you, how many cities can you go do that? And if you did that in the last two or three weeks, what a magnificent bit of color you had along the river. But the three cities have that, but have the same intensity and then be able to do that. But that's what I think is going to be our, our, our sort of real value. Yes? Thanks. Um, when you talk about value capture, um, how do you ensure that enough value is captured so that the amenities that you're talking about, like the shelter or you know, a new metro line, aren't shortchanged? Um, you know, that, that's a good question. Um, um, th this is a this state of art term today is, is, is value capture, if many of you know that. And, and it's sort of built into the first place where tax increment financing districts. That, that was the kind of, as it, as it emerged. I think we're now seeing it much more broadly. Um, uh, I think what you end up doing in some respects is, you, and this is the whole notion of who secures an investment uh, and, and how much it, it, it uh, has to depend upon a certain coverage ratio to make sure that it covers whatever the debt is on what you want to build. So you want to, you want to create a piece of infrastructure that really works. That's, that's what we're saying first and foremost. So what's that going to cost? And you kind of go to that line. Then you work backwards from that and to say, what's going to give me the certainty? Is there enough real estate value that's going to be created there that we can somehow tax that? Is there a, a taxing stream of t sales tax or a portion of property tax? And what usually happens when you go to the bond markets on that, they're saying, OK, that's fine. Give us a good coverage ratio, which means for every dollar you want to borrow, you have a certainty that it's, you're getting a dollar thirty or a dollar forty, and so you have some space to make sure you can pay that. But who stands behind that? So it's a very complex kind of game we play. But I think it's, quite frankly, a central question for the United States in general, and it's what's behind our needs and the way we'll build our infrastructure. We've got to come up with ways to dedicate certain revenue to make these things happen, secure it, and then take what we can. But, but that's, we think at least here's the plans for Metro, the plans for the streetcar should, should meet that standard first and foremost. And because of the city's f financial standing now, it will be able to stand behind those investments. Yes? Yeah, to follow up on that, is it Mike, oh, Mike? yeah, just, you, hi, Scott, why don't you grab the. It would seem that the next round of investment will be marginally more expensive. The, the infrastructure needed is much more expensive than what we've seen so far to, that, to yeah. uh, the investment in the, the current growth. Right. It, it, so the, the point of that is just you're saying that we have to then think even more creatively about how to, how to secure that. Well, j just to let you all know, the, the, the real piece of infrastructure investment we'll need within the next decade is a, new inf is a new metro tunnel under the downtown. What we're doing right now, the present plan only buys us literally about 15 years. If we, if we take the, the regional growth that we're moving at at about 20 to 30,000 jobs a year, and it's happening here, we're going to have to find our way through the downtown. Now, what I find kind of fascinating about this, and, and this is where you, there's an interesting conversation going on, as you all know, which has to do with the height limit in the city. Uh, I think that the, the initial resolution of this, first and foremost, I, I hope, is that Congress will let us in the district decide what our height should be. They should protect what's their property. But the rest of it, what, why they have an ability to impose what goes on in Friendship Heights, I think is crazy. 
There's no reason the federal government should be in our business. In fact, the federal government turns out to be a bunch of local planners who happen to work for an agency with a federal name on it. The, the notion of the federal interest is never very clear as to who's interpreting that. But having said that, first step is let us just make that decision. Secondly is to begin to think about it outside the core. I, I would really like that because at the moment the core still is, is, is growing out and we need to stabilize that. But conceivably, when the time comes to build that infrastructure, we might have the air rights. Which if you know about New York on the second subway, that's what's allowed them to build that area. If we just added literally in downtown Washington, let's say six more floors, set it back. This, this is not an overwhelming number. If you go to great European cities, this is, you know, you're still going to have the same feel. But we would have created this value. But uh, the point is, what we're presently faced at the moment is a sustainable question. It's not on the table at the moment, but I think in the future we'll be looking at that. And that may be the way we kind of deal with it. The other thing that's going to happen that's a fascinating thing that's cutting through a lot of what's happening uh, is um, the issue of the intensification of use of space. Um, for example, the amount of office space per employee, which in the 90s, everybody said, took in the federal government, let's do what the private sector is doing. And so it went up to almost 300 square feet per employee. Today, um, if you work at Living Social or if you're at 1776, if you have 15 or 20 feet, but if you take all the space, it's probably about 100 square feet per employee. So we're, 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 the assumption here is that will people be working in a third less space? It's going to intensify things. Will that generate enough taxes to pay for some of this? Who knows? But th these are the wild cards that are sort of beginning to move through uh, the city. But I, this question of, uh, of this larger piece of infrastructure is out there. It's about 15 years out that we'll be in the conversation about how do we do that. But right now, we have an opportunity, as I said, to just take Metro and fix it. By the way, one of the things that will happen, I think, as a result of uh, this improvement to Metro is that places, and I, I think more like the Southwest, but it'll certainly be true of downtown, are going to be great for reverse commuting. That, 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 that people will be going out to Tyson's to work as opposed to having to live out there. And so we'll be actually, people will live here, but go out elsewhere. And that's going to create, again, an economic opportunity that we haven't thought about before because we're so attractive now. But the access out to the region as opposed to the region coming in, the two-way street, may be something that we haven't anticipated. All of these will create, as I said, probably new revenue streams for the city. Um, and you know, once again, I just want to make real clear, I think most of us recognize this is a city in which 40% of the population uh, lives in families with incomes under $30,000. Uh, and one of the remarkable achievements in the last decade, and it's really come because the real estate investments in downtown uh, have, have risen as much as they have and the city has taxed it. Um, in 1995, I believe, real estate, commercial real estate accounted for, I think, 11% of the city's revenue. Now it's 23%. It's that delta, that space in there that's let us fix the school and do universal health care. But there's still so much more that needs to be done. So we, we're, we're going to always have to balance in the city the investments that kind of come in this infrastructure, some of which we need to, to, to keep in the downtown, others of which are going to have to be the wealth generated to, to meet the great social needs of the city. And that's one of the wonderful things of the, of the city. It's, it's actually trying to figure that out. And I think most of the leaders on the business side and others aren't saying you've got to, you know, got to give us this money. Um, I, I had one piece to it that I, I often think that, you know, this is a specific problem here. I was in London last week at a British bids conference, and I was talking to the people who run the business improvement district uh, along, um, uh, what's the shopping street? What? Street. Um, what? Regent and Bond Street, and at the top it's Oxford. Uh, yeah, in, in that area. The Oxford Circle um, metro stop gets a half a million people a day. You know, it comes through that area. And it's doing somewhere in the neighborhood of about $12 billion in retail sales. The property owners in there who are getting a 14% return investment, however, are only getting 9% back on the taxes they pay to the British government. So it's an area of, these areas of wealth, which people often, are, they condemn and they say, it's a, they are the great, trans, if you like, way of transferring wealth for public purposes elsewhere. That's true of downtown Washington. It's true of London, even to a greater extent than it is here. So as I said, this is just a, a piece of the, the, I think, of what's going on. And to recognize people can sort of dismiss uh, the kind of materialism of, of shopping, and yet it's really creating the jobs and, and fueling economic well-being, certainly throughout uh, the UK. Other questions? A uh, question. Uh, is there any thoughts or preparation for a more car light downtown, uh, not only from the public 
sector point of view, but from the private sector. I was reading an article about uh, like repurposing parking garages and talking with some colleagues today, we're thinking about, well, what about like, uh, I would imagine a lot downtown is underground garages and thinking about repurposing them at maybe, maybe not by 2020, but maybe in the next decade. Uh, my sense is that will emerge, I think the, the idea of um, now moving to, to minimums as opposed to maximum spaces. You know, the, the development community has bought into that notion. Uh, certainly people like Jair Lynch, who are, Jair Lynch who are developing out in the neighborhoods don't want to build any parking whatsoever if they have to. I think for downtown at the moment, there isn't going to be that much more parking, but there, there aren't that many more new buildings. The buildings that I, we're talking about coming here are probably b building on top of what's here. Um, I, I think what you're going to see is just a plateau in that. Um, but I think for our purposes at the moment, um, just recognizing that so much of the workforce still comes in from places that do not have access to transit. We, we have to be, to a certain extent, car friendly. What I think we want them to be is as efficient as possible. So what we're excited about, and we're seeing the first uh, uh, example of it, that when Heinz opens the new garage at city center, 1,500 parking spaces, because that has to serve the retail and the residents, it was, it was, it was required. Um, th they're going to provide people with an app that's going to make it possible for them as they're driving in to actually reserve the parking space they go to. What we'd like to be able to do is soon that would be the case for all parking spaces in downtown. So at least they're not driving around. If they are going to come, they come in. They're probably going to pay a heck of a lot. So we're, we're going to look for congestion pricing in a, in a different way, and it's going to be the way parking gets, gets charged, and that will make it difficult. So if you come to Washington, you'll find a place to park, but it'll be expensive to park. So I think their strategies will merge there. I think the idea over time, um, if when the market's comfortable, I think people will make the, this could have been a parking garage here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess more of my question is, are there preparations being made today? Because part of this article I was reading about is uh, uh, in, the, in the construction process of some of these parking garages to ensure that they'll be sturdy enough to be repurposed for other uses yeah. once their use is done. Yeah. I, I, I've not heard that. They may be. I just, I'm not paying enough attention to the construction. I'll, I'll be curious to ask and see if that's the case. I would presume the good companies are doing that. They seem to be thinking about their buildings in very different ways and realizing they're, they'll be all transformed in the future. Another question I saw was a couple, oh, right here, yeah. But, He's just down this way, right. Right here, coming. Okay, is it okay now? Okay. Hi, Mr. Bradley, my name is Joe uh, Slovenek. Um, uh, I, I respected your presentation very much. I have one specific question. Uh, that I would like you to try to help me get a directory of organizations that work on communications project management in the downtown business <coughs> improvement district, excuse me. Um, I'd, be I'd be careful with the deputy mayor here, but, or, or the deputy mayor's office here. Uh, I, I got a Workforce Investment Act grant to do the Georgetown Certificate of Project Management. But I wanted to have a new marketing plan this spring. Um, and uh, the reason I want the Directory of Communications Project Managers is I found that I have two references from professors in project management, and I have one strong reference from an Obama campaign person who saw me make political phone calls for one, one and a half years, but I am you know, kind of a, a, a partisan person, and I would prefer the downtown BID to the Maryland suburbs in, in those areas. So I did want to ask for special you know, advising on uh, a, a directory of uh, communications project management. I do see your signs that have the phrase embrace the experience and a, a young Georgetown veteran, T.M. Gettin's Neff wrote a story with those phrases, but um, just uh, because uh, this is of some concern because the School of Continuing Studies does sponsor the project management and just asking you, could you please help uh, compile, uh, compile a directory of uh, communications project management organizations in downtown BID or maybe refer me to somebody for, with ideas for new training perhaps. Yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to do that maybe at the conclusion. Just uh, thank you. Was, it, was there a question in the back there? I thought, hand up, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I think it was a really good story you told and amazing transformation of uh, the downtown. And, and you guys gave me a water bottle. I mean, this, you know, <laughs> this is terrific. I, I don't usually get, you know, compensated so well. So, so, so thank you very much. Please come back. Thank you. Good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.